the way the way the partnership works for those who are new is try to identify an ambassador for each of the pilot locations and the ambassador can be someone from the community, uh, a fed, another federal agency representative, um, a local NGO. It really varies pilots and sometimes those ambassadors are ha housed in um, everywhere from in New Orleans, they're in the office of the mayor um, to other federal agency offices to NGOs. So um, next slide please. And so you know the ambassador is really the convening force um, behind the pilot. You know just to flag for you all why DOI is involved in this. We are we really are an urban agency. We may not seem like it but we've been doing tremendous work um, in various pilot locations. USGS is sort of provides the the research the, for water quality and, and quantity research, contaminants, um, so much land use data, um, and has been working in cities for decades. So they, they have partnerships already established with many of the city offices um, and actually get funding um, via state and, and many cities for their water quality work. Um, and we have, you know, 75 urban national parks um, uh, and just you know 101 urban refuges and so we really do have not only a, a big footprint in cities but we also have um, we also have you know some great uh, research and work and restoration already going on um, next slide please So these, this is just some of the, some of the outcomes that you know um, we've been tracking at DOI in terms of you know how has urban waters really helped on the ground, and um, you know this just gives you a sense of um, how Interior is trying to align its efforts and its technical expertise in these areas. Um, and you know, it, we applied for vistas, which are basically uh, college graduates. And they're, they, five of our pilot sites now have these vistas for a three-year period. And believe it or not, that's very helpful to have that sort of staff support that the ambassadors. And and the twenty-five million dollars in title, you know, NPS was really instrumental in making that those happen. But I think you know the beauty of the partnership was we were able to get letters of support um, and and help make that funding um, you know a priority um, for one of our partner agencies, U.S. Department of Transportation. And as you know, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, and now Barbara, uh, thanks to NPS, um, is also contributing in terms of technical assistance. Um, a recent grant that Grand Rapids received. So, you know, kudos to NPS um, for for jumping in and getting involved. Next slide, please. Um, so, what what's going to happen with the Urban Waters Partnership? Well, some of you might already know this. We're having a EPA is. Um, organized a workshop second through fourth, a national workshop, and planning is well underway for that. And we, you know, it's I think there's about 200 folks from across the federal agencies who will be attending, and it's here in Arlington. And I know um, many of uh, the local pilot ambassadors, all of the local pilot ambassadors will be attending, and um, many local NGOs will be attending as well. But sort of um, paralleling that, um, we're one of the things we've been doing, reaching out to national and regional environmental organizations and associations. So everything from um, groups like um, the American Planning Association, the Nature Conservancy, um, to more to even some more smaller sort of. De Los Rios in California, in LA, get them to um, one try to to sign an official you know partner statement 
saying, you know, they endorse the partnership and they're willing to work with us to align their efforts with the federal family for these 18 pilot sites. So we hope to have a press release coming right before the workshop um, December with these 30 NGOs. And really at this workshop we are going to be looking at, you know, what are the next steps for the partnership? You know, moving from um, an initiative to a um, what does that take? Um, how can we better um, further public-private partnerships and get more federal agencies to contribute to the NIFWF Urban Waters Fund? Um, how can we continue leveraging our existing programs and resources across the federal family? For instance, Federal Reserve we tap into their sweet financial partners to, to do this type of green for restoration um, environmental engagement work. And I think I will stop there. And thanks again for this time. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them or shoot me an email, please. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, this is Mark Van Putten again. For those of you who may have joined the call, uh, thank you for joining us. We're now going to move on and get an update from Jason Carey of River Restoration uh, on the uh, project itself and the status of planning for the project. So I will turn it over to Jason Carey. Mark, uh, this is Carey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <coughs> Some technical difficulty. Um, some people have uh, texted me and said that they're having difficulty hearing the presentation. Um, well, I've sent out an alternate phone number, uh, and I'll also try and record this uh, presentation in case uh, we can't get some people on. But the continuing beeping I'm hearing makes me think people are still having trouble getting on. And it uh, looks like uh, Patrick Markham did finally get to join us. Uh, welcome, Patrick. Um, so Jason Carey and we are the river engineer on the project. The Grand River um, flows into Lake Michigan from the uh, central uh, um, uh, peninsula of Michigan, the lower peninsula of Michigan. It flows west into Lake Michigan. Uh, just to orient yourselves for people that don't know where Grand Rapids is, uh, it's about 40 miles interior of Lake Michigan. Um, rapids are regionally rare in in um, Michigan, only comprising about one percent of the habitat of the rivers is actually high gradient rapid habitat. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the Grand River has been heavily modified as early as 1838, uh, uh, even before the city was established. There was a tremendous logging resource up the Grand River, and the rapids provided a choke point for the logs and created a lot of log jams. And so they started drowning out the rapids as early as 1838 in order to float logs downstream to Michigan. Uh, eventually, the gradient of the river provided millage, um, hydropower for milling the logs, and the city began, uh, became established and eventually became the furniture city. Uh, further modifications to the river include <coughs> flood walls along the entire river uh, and four other bowhead dams that were constructed in the river for beautification a.k.a. Uh, keeping sewage floating downstream. Uh, eventually, so the rivers become very uniform and, uh, and uh, tamed, and that is the antithesis of rapid habitat, is to have very uniform conditions in the, in the river. And so basically, the five dams, they spread the uh, river out over the entire channel and the flood walls provide vertical banks. In 19, in the late 80s, <clears throat> there was actually a plan to deck the river, put uh, 
put concrete essentially create the river into an entire culvert and use the decking for parking. Um, fortunately, we are going back the other way with this to look at how to restore the Grand River and the rare and unique rapids that exist there. Let's go to the next slide, Kaylee. Uh, so the project goals are to restore the rapids for everyone. Um, and one of the great things that's been happening in river restoration is that uh, it's become well aligned with recreation. And uh, certainly river restoration has a number of uh, environmental benefits, habitat benefits, uh, but recreation uh, starts to provide a tremendous uh, uh, economic benefit for for uh, projects like this and aligns the communities and finds other communities that help prioritize these projects. Um, so um, restoring the rapids for everyone, improving the habitat and connectivity and the water quality, the riparian functions, and uh, the aesthetics, and creating economic opportunities enhancing underserved communities and instilling a stewardship ethic. Uh, the more people that we can get to the river, especially in these urban cores, the, uh, the more people that take a long-term ethic on the river and understand uh, uh, how polluting and how we live on the land affects the river. And it really does help install it, instill a stewardship ethic in the community. Um, one of the things that we learned when we were working on the project was that there was a really unique condition upstream of the rapid that uh, the for rowing crew and basically the the river is really sheltered there and it's pulled up naturally by the outcrop and the rapid that backwaters a pool upstream, but as well as um, it's uh, uh, sheltered from the wind because of the direction of it and because of the narrowness of the, uh, of the channel. There's uh, ideal conditions for rowing upstream. Uh, the project has opportunity to improve that condition by what we do in the rapid downstream of it. We necessarily affect uh, the river channel upstream of the rapid. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, one of the very exciting things that we found, um, and it's always a concern when we have a large impoundment in a project, uh, especially in an area where there was heavy industrial use, um, there's oftentimes a lot of pollution that, that uh, accumulates in the sediments up, upstream of the dam. And uh, early on, one of the first things we undertook was a uh, phase two environmental um, evaluation of the riverbed to see what kind of pollutants had accumulated uh, behind behind a major dam, the Fourth Street Dam. And we were surprised uh, and pleased to find that there was actually very little fine sediments at all. In fact, the uh, most of what was upstream of the uh, major dam was a large bedrock outcrop. And it turns out that there's very few places in Michigan where these, this bedrock outcrops in the uh, river channels uh, because the bedrock um, is, uh, is rare to be hard enough in Michigan to sustain in the river channels. And so with the bedrock outcrop, we had a very exciting opportunity to really uh, kind of do minimal things um, to create the rapid again. Basically, the rapid was just drowned out by this 
major impoundment. There were no fine sediments. There was no significant pollutant uh, pollutants accumulated behind the dam. And so simply by uh, removing or reducing the dam, we can create a scenario where uh, the rapid upstream can be uncovered and restored pretty uh, directly. Uh, <clears throat> what we did also uh, study was the muscle uh, distribution. The rivers of the United States have some of the richest and diverse uh, populations of freshwater mussels in them. And the Grand River actually has, uh, I think, 19 different species and uh, one in, uh, federally listed endangered species, the snuffbox mussel. We actually found five uh, mussel, uh, snuffbox mussels in the uh, river channel. Uh, the mussels, surprisingly, also were located, for the most part, upstream of the dam and uh, very few downstream of the main dam. And uh, uh, so at any rate, there's opportunity to enhance the mussel habitat that's both both for the listed species as well as as the other species that exist in the reach. Uh, downstream of the main dam <clears throat> is where uh, the historical accounts, and again, these are accounts back pre-photographs uh, from, from the mid-1800s. Really, by 1868, the river channel had been dredged and, and uh, modified. The uh, side channels had been largely filled in to build the riverfront. A lot of that material came out of the main channel of the river. And um, so by 1868, uh, and the Army Corps, well, the, the engineer, the Department of the Army at that time, um, attempted to get navigation up the main channel of the Grand River from Lake Michigan. And um, all those efforts combined uh, dredged out the main channel of the river to um, to clean it of all its substrate. And so uh, through the main, through the heart of the city and downstream of the main dam, the idea is to restore the rapid that existed there. Uh, largely that rapid was a deposit of boulders from the glacial uh, period of the retreat of the glaciers when the, uh, when the Grand River was transporting large material and the glaciers were providing large substrate to deposit in the river channels. And then again, um, so uh, the interesting thing about the rapid is through the city, basically on this uh, page that we're looking at, there's 18 foot of hydraulic head or eight, the rapid drops 18 feet across two miles of the city. Uh, from the right end of this uh, diagram here to Lake Michigan is over 40 miles and the river only, uh, the river elevation only drops four feet over that period or over that distance. And so the river bed actually being four feet lower um, under the bridges than the surface of the river is at the same elevation as Lake Michigan. And so from downstream of the project, and it's actually uh, uh, downstream of the project is in the Section 10 jurisdiction of the Army Corps for Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. Uh, providing interstate stream commerce navigation. And from downstream of the project, there's a lot of opportunity to provide uh, shoreline access and uh, eventually types of things, uh, as docks and that type of thing that may provide uh, uh, ways to navigate out to Lake Michigan from the city itself. Let's go to the next slide, Kaylee. Kaylee, are you there? Um, 
So uh, again, I alluded to it earlier, but the uh, the outdoor recreation industry is a uh, is another very coming in with these uh, partner uh, restoration opportunities. Uh, the outdoor recreation industry is a $646 billion industry, making it one of the top five industries in the United States of America, making it one of the top employers of the United States of America. And really, um, again, healthy environments are well aligned with the outdoor recreation uh, industry. Um, so the project has ecological, economic, recreational, and community benefits. Uh, we, uh, the project undertook a economic impact study just to look at the recreation impact uh, of the project and found that uh, conservatively the, uh, the economic impact of the project would be estimated at 15.9 to 19.1 million dollars per year. Um, we have uh, an estimated price tag of the river project, um, just the wet. We call it. We differentiate the river from the shoreline because certainly a project like this will create a number of shoreline opportunities and redevelopment along the riverfront, uh, so we differentiate it by calling it surf and turf. Uh, but the wet part of the project, to restore the rapids, modify the dams, uh, is estimated at $27.5 million. And the reason on that is up to $19.1 million per year. Again, that does not include, it does include uh, recreational activities such as kayaking, fly fishing, rafting, uh, Stand-up paddle boards, which uh, you'll see the acronym SUP a lot when you start looking at these types of projects, and other types of riverfront recreation. Um, so in addition, the improved riverfront property utilization and tax taxable values could increase by over $100 million. Uh, we also looked at some of the ecosystem services and uh, for instance, we uh, estimate about 80 acres of improved sturgeon, uh, lake sturgeon spawning habitat, and a recent project in the St. Clair River on the other side of Michigan invested $1.3 million into a one-acre spawning reef. And so ecosystem services as well could have over $100 million type of impact to the project. <clears throat> um, and additional shoreline and interaction with the city economic benefits are expected through the other processes and community organizations that have developed around this project. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jason. This is Mark Van Putten again. Thanks for that overview of the project. We'll have time at the end for uh, questions and comments. Perhaps one of the most significant developments since the kickoff meeting of the Urban Water Federal Partnership in October of 2013 was this spring's endorsement by the Grand Rapids City Commission of the restoration vision that Jason has just described. And the city has been a great uh, partner and leader in this project, working with Grand Rapids Whitewater, with the state of Michigan, and with the federal agencies. So next, we're going to give you an update on the process <coughs> excuse me, that the City Commission set in motion uh, along with its endorsement of this vision to now go forward with the detailed planning and the implementation and realization of the vision. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, the City Commission appointed a steering committee to provide overall coordination. It includes representatives of business and community leaders. It includes tribal leaders. It includes representatives of the state of Michigan. It includes the mayor of the city of Grand Rapids. But uh, most notably for our purposes, it includes representatives of the, fe the two federal co-lead agencies, Scott Hicks of the US Fish and Wildlife Service 
and Kristen Williams from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And Scott and Kristen are going to give us a quick overview of the steering committee process. So Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Mark. So as Mark mentioned, Kristen and I were invited to participate on the, the steering committee because of our agency's roles in the Urban Waters Federal Partnership. And we just wanted to provide some background information today as, as one waters partners to stay informed and engaged. So as Mark mentioned, it, it kicked off in 2013 and was um, initially in 23, December of 2013 and in March 2014, the city commission officially appointed members to the committee. And we've been meeting um, quarterly and as needed. So at times it's been you know, roughly monthly. I think we've met about six times so far. And, and again, the, the steering committee is, again, purely advisory. Advising the city commission is kind of the role. So on this first slide here, we kind of see kind of the purpose of the committee. And one of the first things that the committee um, set out to do was to try and develop some guiding principles to kind of inform how the committee would operate. And Christian's going to go over those in just a minute. But some of the other purposes for the committee were to you know, guide the effort related to the restoration of the Grand River and the riverbank development, really a, a coordination um, function. Um, encourage effective communication between the, the studies, plans, and projects. Cultivate support from public and private sectors related to the river restoration, a vision that includes a, a diverse community interest. Encourage coordination of fundraising through federal and state grants and private funding. And again, this is really just sharing information about opportunities and trying to facilitate um, coordination among those opportunities. And then lastly, another thing we'll talk about this morning um, in more detail is explore organizational models for the long-term management and programming. So I guess kind of just to, to summarize real quickly, what's kind of been eye-opening for me is the energy and the scope of what the city is trying to achieve. I think there's going to be many opportunities to collaborate and, and see results. Um, so I guess with that, I'll hand it over to Christian to kind of talk about a little bit of the, the, the groundwork that's been laid through the development of some guiding principles. Haley, if you want to do next slide. Oh, there on there. Um, basically, at the beginning, um, when we all identified that we needed a reason to be there. We needed to give ourselves meaning. Um, and so we worked quite hard on developing these guiding principles uh, for the committee. Um, we needed a way to basically, how, how are we going to make decisions or how are we going to give the advice that we need to give as an advisory committee? Um, so these are some of the guiding principles that uh, we wanted to go over. We thought it was important to go through these with you. Um, first off, we need to recognize that the Grand River belongs to everyone and contributes to our quality of life. Um, the Grand River, as it flows through Grand Rapids, is a part of a watershed that has regional implications. Um, and I believe that's where a lot of our partners, partner agencies, would come in. Um, every action should improve the ecological condition of the watershed and be an, be an exemplar for others. Um, seek to balance human interaction, commercial investment, and environmental considerations. Consider future generations by ensuring that actions are sustainably designed, well-managed, responsibly assessed, continu continuously evaluated, and corrective action taken as necessary. And preserve and restore habitat for desirable species and deter invasive species. Um, Kaylee, next slide. And um, a few more of these. Direct and develop the capacity and resources necessary to enhance all human and natural habitats. Encourage innovation, the leveraging of resources, and shared accountability by engaging residents, businesses, government, education, philanthropy, and non-governmental organizations. Celebrate our history and cultural diversity. Ensure that future development of the river and its edges contributes to the local economy by creating wide-ranging investment, recreation, and employment opportunities for all. 
to develop the programming of places, activities, and to be accessible and safe for everyone, being mindful of social and or physical barriers. And use intentionally inclusive and transparent decision making to foster ownership of a reimagined Grand River watershed that serves as a beacon for civic identity. Um, I know each agency usually has a, a mission, a vision, and um, business planning as well. And some of these might tie back into the other agencies are doing as well. Great, that, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Scott and Kristen, for that presentation and for your role on the steering committee. As I mentioned a moment ago, I want to emphasize includes representatives of the state of Michigan, someone designated specific governor who highlighted this project in his State of the State address last year and has been a stalwart champion. And Larry Romanelli, the chief of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, is also a member of the steering committee, so there's Native American involvement as well. As uh, Scott and Kristen indicated in their review, one of the uh, early tasks that the steering committee has taken on is to look toward the future and models for public-private organizations that might be created to, over the long run, sustain the vision of river restoration, to instill, instill stewardship, to conduct programming, and also to actually, to the extent there are structures uh, or bank side access sites, potentially uh, own, lease, maintain, operate those structures. So the steering committee created a long-term organizational models work group, which I chair, and I just want to give you a quick on that work. Uh, next slide, Kaylee. Um, so that uh, work group, uh, here's the scope of work for it. Uh, four tasks. First of all, figure out what exactly uh, this uh, entity or entities might be asked to do over the long run. And as I indicated, ranging from owning property, managing property, programming and assuring sustainable financing for this. Uh, so that's our first task. Uh, the second task is to cast a wide net and identify examples and models of elsewhere around the country where there are these kinds of pu public-private entities. Uh, third, we'll look at existing organizations in the West Michigan region and their organizational capacities. Uh, there may well be existing organizations that could undertake some of the tasks we identify. And then finally, to recommend uh, an organizational structure or structures and entities that might perform these roles. Our timetable provides for coming back to the steering committee early next spring with those recommendations. So we're well underway with our scope of work. The last point I wanted to mention here is the city of uh, Grand Rapids has received a technical assistance grant from the National Park Service, uh, one of the key uh, parts of which is for the service to assist this work group in its work. Obviously, the Park Service has uh, a wide variety of experiences in working with public-private partnerships, uh, not only in traditional national parks, but national heritage areas. And we're very fortunate that Barbara Nelson Jamison of the National Park Service uh, is uh, pursuant to this grant uh, uh, helping us with this work. And I believe Barbara is on. And I wanted to turn it over to her for a few comments on the Park Service's role with this project. We're not sure whether Barbara is with us, so uh, if I don't hear her speak up, uh, the slide you see describes the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program, which is the program of the service that works with partners uh, outside of designated park service units. And as you can see here, they've been very active in helping protect uh, rivers, trails, and conserving open spaces. We've had uh, just some more examples of some of the specific projects in the Michigan area. Barbara is based at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore in 
southwestern Michigan, about where number six is on the slide you see in front of you, and has a significant experience in working across the state with a variety of partners. And here's some of the projects they've already worked on in Michigan. Next slide. So anyway, we wanted to mention this because of this work of the work group of the steering committee, but also to illustrate one way in which federal agencies are already contributing to this project, in this particular instance, through their technical At this point, we're going to move on and talk about the river corridor plan and the planning process indicated in talking about the economic impact study. That study focused primarily on the economic benefits of the wet portion of the project, the restoration of the rapids and the natural conditions to that two and a half miles of Grand River. Obviously, there are tremendous opportunities in repairing neighborhoods and communities along the river banks. And in recognizing that the city commission and the city, uh, working with other partners, has undertaken a corridor planning process. And here's where there may be a, a many opportunities for federal agencies, particularly the non-natural resource-oriented agencies, to participate in and contribute to this project. So we've asked Suzanne Schultz, planning director of the city of Grand Rapids, and Jay Stephan, the assistant planning director, to give a brief overview of this river corridor and downtown development planning process. So I'll turn it over to Suzanne. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about what we're doing on the, on the whole plan process side. And it, it gets confusing rather quickly. So hopefully this will be clear uh, as we go forward. Um, there's been a number of different things that have happened in Grand Rapids over the past 15 years, including adoption of the new master plan. Uh, we had the plan that was from 1963, so we had a 40 years later a new plan. We uh, had an update to that plan called Green Grand Rapids, and that plan recommended looking at restoration of the rapids to the river. And Chris and Chip kind of took that, uh, I mean, and, and ran with it. It's been amazing the energy that they've brought to this work. Um, the downtown also had its own plan that was done about 20 years ago. And that plan has been fully implemented. And I think what you'll, you'll hear is this theme of both collaboration that we try to do in our planning processes, but also implementation. And uh, if it's in the plan, it's meant to be accomplished. And our community is very serious on getting that done with a collaborative approach. So um, in this chart, what you see is downtown committee. They are the ones working on the downtown plan piece. River Corridor Committee, which is looking at the banks, or the turf, as Jason calls it. And then the River Restoration Steering Committee, which you already heard from Scott and Christian about the work of that group. These plans, uh, especially from the Corridor Plan Committee and the Downtown Committee, feed into our Planning Commission, which is a policy body, and then ultimately to our City Commission. This process work is so important for us because uh, the city as the owner of the dam and the flood walls, the city as the permit applicant, the elected officials being on the city commission as representatives of the entire community, making sure that they have the, constituency, the constituent support and that background in a process that supports the decision making that they have to do, uh, we view as an essential component to our work. And so you start to see some of these structures evolving. On top of the nexus with the downtown plan and river corridor plan efforts, Grand Rapids Public Schools is also looking at a near campus plan that so you see on this diagram, um, museum school and central campus plan. River restoration is identified as a project um, that's blending into all the plan work. And then recently we've added flood protection um, within this body of work. Because certainly uh, the discussions that we've had over the past decade, I believe, with FEMA uh, is now really playing into this as we are in the LAMP process uh, with FEMA on addressing flood protection and mitigation along the river corridor. So trying to put all of this within one lens 
of what you have for river, river restoration, infrastructure around the river being the flood walls and need for flood protection, how you do land development on those banks and, and have this kind of cross view of everything while also engaging the community is of critical importance to us. So at the top of this, this diagram that you see, you can see we, we started off this past spring with that dialogue after a lot of planning and discussion. The river restoration project has been going on longer with a lot more dialogue. Um, but the, the combination of the downtown plan, river corridor plan began this spring and summer. This fall, we're now reaching out to community organizations and neighborhood groups, which Jay will talk about in a minute. Uh, and eventually, the goal is, is that it all meets up at the very end, where uh, we have this one solid vision to implement everything that the community has said that they would like to see happen. Um, and, and really, the role of the River Corridor Plan Committee on the wet side um, is, not, is, is coordinating both with Grand Rapids Whitewater and the goals that we have, but to provide that vision for the future, to take all of those aspects, downtowns included, as it touches in the river, but really looking at the river corridor um, and, and being able to implement that. We have, a, we have this focus and tradition of big ideas being implemented. The downtown plan reflected building a new arena, an uh, enhanced convention center. We've accomplished those. The idea 20 years ago of separating our storm and sanitary sewers has been completed this year. So the timing is really right when we look at the things we've already accomplished, the improvement, the significant improvement in water quality that's now accomplished with separating our storm and sanitary sewer, and then also a lot of discussion about trails uh, and connectivity to neighborhoods in the greater region is kind of coming to a head. So one of those guiding principles that is, uh, was included with the River Restoration Steering Committee that Christian mentioned was having an intentionally inclusive and transparent process. And for us, that really focuses on making sure that everyone is at the table, public interest, private interest, philanthropic community, federal, state, local officials, and that we have this cross-sectoral uh, representation of people with environmental, economic, and human interests um, including groups like Disability Advocates of Kent County, the Urban League, and others, to uh, bring them to the table and have this robust discussion. The function of the River Corridor Plan Committee is to make sure that we're coordinating what happens on the banks with what's in the river and the downtown, to provide that forum for exchange of ideas and discussion and dialogue, um, and, and to cultivate and refine a vision for that area that we know in the long run, that's, that's where if you ask any Grand Rapidian, where's the future going for Grand Rapids? What's that big idea that's going to take us to a whole nother level in the community and build that civic pride and ownership and really make, you know, put us on the map. Everyone identifies what's happening with the river. And so the momentum that, that Scott mentioned is truly there and it's very, very exciting, but we've got to be able to make sure it's feasible, it's reasonable, we've got to figure out how to make the numbers work to make it happen, and so those recommendations for implementation also are the responsibility of the River Court or Plan Committee. This map shows, uh, it gives you an idea of the scope of the project. The orange area is the downtown plan area, which is the boundaries of our downtown development authority. They are funding the work for the downtown plan. Um, and then the river corridor extends basically a little bit further outside of the city boundaries, but certainly goes from Lamoureux Park to the north down to Millennium Park to the south uh, within that whole reach. We've combined this downtown plan and river plan piece, we're calling it GR Forward. So you can go to the GR Forward website and see all of the work that's being done associated with both planning efforts and the, the collection of ideas that we're already starting to take. So when we reference GR Forward, it's, it's a combination of both of um, these pieces. 
the goal with the corridor plan is really to look at the opportunities that we have for programming, trails, open space, economic development, uh, what happens around the river restoration projects. So the work of what happens in the water is the catalyst for what happens both on the banks and above on land uh, to really transform our community. And so that is the dialogue that we're having with the communities this fall and, and really talking about how do we maximize how we bring people to the river. How do we improve that access to parks, to water? How can people touch the water uh, and really start to interact with it? Um, and where is that? So the river's now a seam rather than a barrier in the community that brings people together. The access piece in particular um, brings forth a lot of discussions, which is one of the reasons why uh, we are thrilled that FEMA is now a member of the Federal Partnership because we really think this is an opportunity if we're talking about whether or not we're going to uh, go for certification or free board deficient, there's different infrastructure opportunities that really could improve access to the river. So as we go through the LAMP process, uh, we're, we're very, very excited to think about infrastructure as a tool to be able to not only provide flood protection and mitigation to our community and property owners, but also use that infrastructure to enhance quality of life and provide those connections to the river that we really, in a lot of cases, do not have um, because they serve as barriers. As has been mentioned, uh, the industrial corridor used to follow along the river. When we redid our zoning ordinance, 40% of the land that we had zoned industrial was changed to mixed use, uh, which is really reflective of all of the changes that you've seen along the river as old furniture factories are changing into lofts and office buildings. And so the land use component of this, you know, stretching out from the center of the river to what happens on the, on the, the edges to what happens on land is an important piece for us to understand as is those regional connections and regional influence areas. Uh, we were very fortunate several years ago to have a partnership with the Department of Natural Resources and Michigan Department of Transportation uh, where a rail corridor was purchased along the east edge of the river. That connection will allow us to take uh, anybody can travel from downtown to northern Michigan to Cadillac on the White Pine Trail. This hubs and spokes idea that Grand Rapids is the second largest city in Michigan has all these trails leading to it and the river being the spine of those connections uh, is very important and we've already started to build in some of those components and opportunities as we've executed a plan from the 80s called the River Edges Plan where we've tried to create connections along the river to provide that access to people. But there can be so much more done and a lot of other opportunities which is why we're reaching out to the public to have those discussions with them about what does a reimagined river look like. The river restoration project as a catalyst for that, the opportunity with infrastructure, with thinking about what happens with flood protection, and then how does it go into the neighborhoods. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jay to talk about how we're engaging people in that discussion. Thank you, Suzanne. So how do we how do we get input from the public? Uh, it's critical that we go out and we talk to others about this project. And we're doing that in various forms. We've just recently opened um, a space in downtown that offers opportunities for folks to visit the space and interact with a number of exhibits. We talk about the downtown. What would you like to see in the downtown? Where are the areas that need improvement? How, do you, how safe do you feel? Why do you come down to Grand Rapids? Why do you not? Um, we're also talking to them about the river. What opportunities or constraints are there? What type of programming and events might you like to see along the river? So that open house will be open between now and November 21st. We're, op we're offering regular business hours open to the public. But we're also inviting special interest groups to come down. So we'll be contacting schools, K through 12 classes, having them come down, colleges and universities and other special interests who we would love to hear from that could come down and interact um, in that space. Um, but we also feel as if it's important for us to take um, the show on the road and go visit the neighbors in their own neighborhoods. Um, 
not everybody feels comfortable coming downtown uh, to attend events. Not everybody feels comfortable going to uh, large venues. So we'll actually be meeting with the neighborhoods um, in person and uh, talking to them about the vision. In addition to that, we're going to be doing surveys for residents, for uh, visitors, and for workers in the downtown. Uh, we'll be conducting very, uh, focus groups with anglers, artist groups who may be interested in seeing river art along the banks of the river or in the river, and also uh, the numerous regulatory agencies. We are uh, on have social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, as Suzanne mentioned, if you want to learn more about the GR Forward, we have a website, grforward.org. We also plan to have a speaker series, and there is part of that website also interactive mapping. The neighborhood engagement strategy will be uh, launched on several levels. We plan to host a variety of uh, wide citywide forums. Uh, this map is illustrative of our neighborhood meetings. And so the green areas that you see, um, we'll, we will be holding sub-regional meetings in each of those neighborhoods, probably a couple meetings uh, in the next six months. Uh, the areas that you see in orange are the neighborhood associations that are immediately adjacent or contiguous with the river. And we are planning. Um, a series of meetings, three meetings with each of those neighborhood uh, groups. Uh, the first meeting will be a discussion of the overall process. The second meeting will be a discussion about um, how some of the public spaces uh, might look in the future. And the third meeting will be uh, kind of a confirmation of what we heard from the neighborhoods as far as the downtown and the river corridor. Did we hear what you were saying? And, and, did, and are they reflected in the recommendations and the plans that we have for some of those uh, public spaces along the river? The next slide is a schedule of coordination. It talks about uh, when we're hoping to submit permits, when the uh, community and steering, com uh, the steering committees will be meeting. Um, and of, of particular importance for us is the orange blocks are the community engagement that, that we anticipate having uh, with the neighbors. Great. Thank you, Suzanne and Jay, for describing that process. Um, this is uh, Mark Van Putten again. On the slide that Jay just showed, Kaylee, can you go back one slide? It's one point uh, I think is worth highlighting in terms of the timetable is the first bullet here with permit submission. The operating assumption for the WET project, for the Grand Rapids Whitewater-led project, is that by the summer of 2015, they will be, uh, there will be the submission to the regulatory agencies, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, foremost amongst them, uh, of uh, applications for permits. The current plan is the city of Grand Rapids will be the permit applicant for that work. So you see that here on that schedule. So much of the timeline that you've seen related to the steering committee, related to the river corridor and downtown development committee are intended to help inform that process as well as Suzanne said, uh, benefit from the river and rapids restoration, recognizing it's the catalyst for all of these other things. So I wanted to highlight for the group you know, how uh, important is this a very robust effort to coordinate the wet and the dry. If we could go forward, Kaylee, to our, I think, our final slide. <clears throat> so at this point, uh, what we hope to do is to hear from any of you who are on the phone of any of the opportunities that uh, have occurred to you of ways in which your federal agency might help the project, any programs or assets you have in or near the area that could become part of this. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we're really interested in models for public-private partnerships and ways in which federal agencies have been part of projects like this. As is illustrated by the National Park Service role, there may be expertise your agencies have, particularly with respect to the river corridor and the planning processes 
We are particularly interested in examples of how restoration of urban waters brings communities together, particularly historically underserved populations. I think the extent to which that is important here is illustrated by the fact that one of the two co-chairs of the steering committee is Joe Jones, who is president of the Grand Rapids Urban League. So we're very interested in, if you will, environmental justice related examples. And then obviously funding. Uh, if there are funding opportunities, as Lisa Pelstring illustrated with her opening comments, uh, we're obviously very interested in hearing about those uh, opportunities. So let me just pause there and see if uh, who's on the phone has any suggestions with res or ideas with respect to these opportunities or if you have any questions about any of the presentations, now would be a great time to, to take them. So I'm asking Kaylee, how are we doing this? Are we looking for virtual hands, or are we just going to open up all of the phone lines? I guess we'll just open it up. So if you have a, a, a question, just feel free to speak up and identify yourself. This is Ken Hincherlong at FEMA. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can, Ken. Okay. Well, Susanna talked about uh, a number of different initiatives, and I applaud the, I mean, FEMA applauds the, this effort. Um, I, I wanted to just make note of and acknowledge uh, the, the city's efforts in LAMP and wanted to explain that acronym, if I could, and maybe just give a, a, a one-minute background on that. That'd be uh, great, Ken. The word LAMP stands for Levy Analysis and Mapping Procedure. It came about following a stakeholder meetings in 2011, and Grand Rapids was one of those stakeholders. Um, they, and it's, these were national conversations. Uh, actually, uh, in Washington, D.C., I believe there was a, an August uh, meeting in 2011, which was a, um, I, I think they call it a, a roundtable. So uh, prior to 2011, we had a trigger. Uh, either a levy was found to be accreditable and met all of our standards, or if it wasn't able to meet those standards, we would take a position that the levy was not accreditable and would place areas landward and flood prone as, uh, as, as a special flood hazard area with all the necessary triggers for flood insurance uh, within the lending environment, as well as floodplain management. In 2011, we, after, after meeting with these uh, stakeholders, we developed what we now have as a procedure to look at some various alternatives or, or options which can model specific reaches of a, of a larger system and look at those reaches, whether they're freeboard deficient or or have, uh, and, and this is with respect to a 1% annual chance stage. Uh, the definition of freeboard is, is, is the necessary height above that 1% stage to find uh, uh, sufficient certification and, and uh, accreditation. So if, if there isn't a full height of a flood wall, for instance, uh, but there is some height, some sufficient protection, uh, we, we can go under LAMP and and develop a protection landward or develop a designation for flood insurance rate maps landward that may be a zone D or other other aspects, uh, a zone D being a non-mandatory flood, uh, flood zone um, across the designation. So without going into a lot of details about LAMP, it, 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 it is an accommodation, it's a negotiation, and we are in the stages right now through a a biweekly steering committee, we're calling it a local levy partnership with the, and adjacent communities are part of that conversation. And our, and our goals are to have a, a draft plan uh, before the end of the calendar year and the final and formal plan uh, sometime uh, late winter or spring of next year. Um, there are there are challenges to merging objectives uh, with with the uh, with the larger Grand Grand Rapids Whitewater and, and the uh, uh, 
and, and the larger restoration initiatives here. And I, I, um, I think most of those challenges have to do with timetables and expectations. Um, uh, the, the city is going to do the right thing in the long term, but then in the short term, I'm obligated by national policy to have a 24-month clock, actually 18 month, 18 to 24-month clock following the release of the plan, uh, and and that would set in, in that would set the uh, the tone for maps that would follow for for the areas landward of the levee oh, flood walls. Uh, the last thing I want to say, though, is that. Um, um, we do understand that uh, there's there's modeling involved when, when, with regard to permits. Um, FEMA has made available our, our 2010 HECRAS model. Uh, it, uh, there may be some, when, when you talk about frequencies, less than a 1% chance there may be some need to calibrate uh, on events lower. But at least for the 1% chance, we've got, uh, we've got this, uh, uh, I think, after four years of conversation, 2007 to 2010, We've got a good, solid hydraulic model, and the city has been using it in the last year as they evaluate all the options here and all of the different stakeholders and and uh, uh, opportunities. So, um, amen to that, Ken. <laughs> we've 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 also Fish Creek Thompson, Carr, and Huber, as you know, Tim Small again, uh, has been working with River Restoration on the hydraulic models to understand um, as. You know, as the river changes, you know, if you take out the the dam, what different, you know, what what impact does that have? So we've been now that we have the model agreed upon, we are using that model um, for all those pieces. And I think what's really interesting is as the river's been broken into the reaches, it does lead to a different, you know, to a discussion about do we do you want, you know, now that we know what the baseline is. Do we want flood zone D? Do we want flood zone X? Uh, if we're looking forward and thinking about climate resiliency and uh, potentially affected areas, what potential insurance impacts we might have in certain areas of the city, uh, we're very excited about the opportunity to try to figure out how to include what you need in the LAMP document <coughs> with those community goals. And if there's not a way to, to meet those multiple objectives of better access to the water and better flood protection and um, you know incre increased programming for recreation um, throughout that reach. So um, I think the challenge for us, I think you identified it correctly, is what are those expectations and timetables um, as, as our key challenges. Thank you, Ken and Suzanne. Any other? either questions about the presentation or ideas or observations about ways in which the federal agencies participating in this call can help? If not, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, this is Chris Muller from uh, Grand Rapids Whitewater. Thank you for all your time today. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, we're up against is we have this awesome alignment of uh, support, uh, both in the community with the different governing agencies, um, the state, local, and then this designation. And what we're trying to do as an organization is is really run with that, that energy and run with that support. And it's critical that we get to, um, you know, get to as much assistance as is, is out there. So this is a very important call for us. Um, you know, permitting is one thing. Fundraising, fundraising is another thing. Um, we have the local support. We have the story. We think we've gone through the process correctly. We have a great team behind it. Um, but we really need everyone to kind of think creatively about how do we accomplish this because I think it it'll be a great case study for all the rest of the rivers in the country of how do you really define a process, um, ensure uh, engagement, but then come out with a really great project. So um, yeah, if there's anything out there, I mean Mark and I are available offline as well if that's a better forum for, for comments and conversations, but uh, um, definitely want to try to figure out how do we put some pressure on this to, to accomplish the project so all these other discussions can fall into place as well. 
So thank you, Chris. Um, hey, Mark. This is Lisa yes, Pelsering from Interior, and I just yeah. wanted to um, sort of flag. I, I had to jump in and out of this call a little bit, but um, and I'm hoping that um, did we identify? Were we able to identify someone from the Economic Development Administration to attend this call or for a future meeting, perhaps? Um, yes, we were. I spoke yesterday afternoon with Patrick Leidick, who was oh, right. the regional point of contact, and Lee Sherry of EDA had been with us a year ago, October. They were both invited to participate in today's call. I'm not sure whether they were on, but we will certainly follow up with them. The reason I, the reason I suggest following up with them is that um, I do know at the headquarters level, um, EDA has recognized Urban Waters as one of its um, investment funding priorities. So for their um, sort of economic development focused projects, um, potential applicants who are part of the Urban Waters, you know, 18 sites, when they apply for um, funding assistance, and I think the city has to take the lead on that um, application effort, that it, it, the, the pilots automatically meet sort of that in, an initial evaluation requirement within EDA's grant process, grant review process. So um, I just wanted to flag that for you as a potential. And then um, one other thing that has been pretty exciting for, I think, DC and for um, LA is uh, working with the Federal Reserve, and we're really just starting to make these connections stronger now, but the Federal Reserve is very interested in sort of community um, development, and for a long time has really focused on affordable housing is my impression, but now they're looking sort of at the, beyond that, at the landscape in terms of transit-oriented development and um, parks and recreation for um, uh, lower income housing. And so I do think the Federal Reserve, um, we should talk offline and, and figure out how we might be able to tie them in to this effort. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else have any questions or observations? If not, as a group, on your screen you should see contacts for follow-up, which includes the urban water agency co-leads from the Department of the Interior and from USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service. You see uh, Chris Muller and my uh, contact information at the local ambassadors, and uh, any of us would be happy to speak with any of you. As Lisa said at the beginning of this call, in early December there will be a national meeting in D.C. of representatives from all of the Urban Water Federal Partnership sites across the country, both federal agencies and other partners. And undoubtedly, a lot of ideas will come out of there seeing what other locations are doing and things that might be relevant and rapid. So we thought it would make sense to have another call in January so those of us who have been to the meeting in D.C. have a chance to sort of process what happened and uh, come back to the group and perhaps have some more specific ideas about how individual agencies could participate in the Grand River uh, project. So uh, Kaylee will be sending out uh, information on that call uh, that we will schedule in January. One thing I wanted to ask uh, as we close is if you are not the right representative from your federal agency to participate in these calls, we would really appreciate it if you could help us navigate your agency and find out who is. And uh, if you could either let me know or Kaylee know by email, uh, either confirming that you're the right representative or if there's someone else or someone in addition to you that you would like to be kept informed about this project and invited to participate in future calls, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, anything else? Anyone here around the table wants to say? If not, I want to uh, thank uh, all of you on the phone for taking time to be with us this morning. Thank those who are gathered here and who have helped with the presentations. 
<clears throat> and also to acknowledge and thank Chip Richards and Chris Muller, the co-founders of Grand Rapids Whitewater, who have been such valiant volunteers over many years now in moving this process forward. So thank you all, and hope you have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.